The Earnestly Speaking Podcast is a show that is founded on free-flowing conversation and may at times venture into mature subjects. Listener discretion is advised. Earnestly Speaking Podcast here on February 6, 2020. Uh... This is actually not the first podcast I've recorded in the last uh, 48 hours. I'm kind of on a roll here. It was kind of strange because the last 10 days has been kind of a... And I, and I spoke about that a little bit on the last couple of shows. It's been, it's been kind of a... Let's just say... It's a weird last week and a half. Uh, of course, this podcast you can find on, iTunes, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Google, Google uh, Play iHeartRadio, all that stuff. And also, please, you guys get a chance also to leave, rate and review the show if you get a chance, especially on, especially on Apple Podcasts. It does help the, the the show, whether or not it gets noticed through the, uh, you know, the publications of the, of the of the platform, whatever it would be. But I uh, really appreciate you guys uh, if you could uh, rate and review the show for me. Um, but, yeah, as I was saying, it's been the last really strange week and a half, obviously still the, you know, the residue of the Kobe Bryant tragedy, um, I spoke about this on, I did a quick, you know, quick hitting pod last week, um, a couple of days after the, the, his passing, um, and then I, you know, I, I've, I've touched, I've touched on it on the last couple of episodes too, I've done, um, with, uh, with Zach, the generate last week, with Mark Francois yesterday, and then I did the, uh, Pod with Roz and G earlier today. Um, and we t- actually had a nice conversation about Koi Bryant and everything, everything that was surrounding that. Uh, so this is actually the first like real solo pod I've done on this show, like long form I've done since the new year. Uh, I think I did one in on, I think early January. That's about it. But you know, obviously the the, the residue of Koi Bryant, the tragedy and all that, it's it's still there. Um, you know. Um, and you know, it, it really feels like I fell behind on a lot, of, talking about a lot of things I want to talk about. Like a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff I had on, um, on deck to talk about. Um, prior to his death, I actually had planned on doing the podcast that day uh, on a couple things that I'll touch on today. And then the moment we heard the news about Kobe's passing, um, that kind of took everything side, sideways, you know, I couldn't focus, I couldn't, it was, it was just one of those things where it really ate up all my, uh, you know, my emotions in a lot of ways, um, I mean, this is, this is a, it was, it was a shock beyond all shocks, you know, it took me for a loop of emotions, you know, and then you have the layers of the tragedy, it was this Koi Bryant, 41, it was his daughter at 13, it was seven other people on that, on that, on that helicopter that passed away as well too, three kids, of course, um, so it was one of those things where, you know, and I, 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 I'm, I, I'm some of a sense of a guy to some degree, you know, but this is a, an extra layer, you know, so a, a lot of things I want to talk about through, you know, in the last few weeks, you know, I haven't had a chance to really, uh, touch on that really on a solo pod, you know, I've been, as, as, as I said, the guests I want to get, I have on the show, there's, there's a, a plan of what we want, to do, things we want to talk about, and which is fine. But we want to get, I want to get in a solo pod as soon as possible. And I, you know, figure, well, look, <laughs> want to roll right now. I've done two shows already um, in the last forty-eight hours. I'm proud of that. One out of third one. Who gives a shit? Just, just go, just go, go right through it. You know, I'm a, totally okay with that. Um, so yeah, the, the Kobe stuff is really just, it's, it's really impacted me in a lot of ways. Um, two weeks later, um, again, I've explained this on the show before. You know. I, I I think the not just the layers of the grief in terms of who was involved in the uh, the you know the the crash, but also um, the the fact that you know you know the respect I have for the guy, you know the respect I grew I grew to have Coy Bryant, you know, um, and again the, 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 he always. Most of his career, and I go as far as saying all of his career that I followed him, he always felt real and accessible to me in the ways that other guys, comparably so, like Michael Jordan, was not. And, um, you know, 
it, it, it's 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 a, it's a shock. It's, it's it's still a shock to me now that he's not here. You know, the guy, you know the guy had a lot to probably had a lot to give post basketball. You know, I was looking forward to hear, to seeing his entrepreneurial um, goals moving forward. And you know, he got, I mean, the guy won an Oscar. <laughs> you know, uh, so it's, uh, it's I guess it's, it's still sad. But I, I but I don't want to dwell on that right now on, on this show either because uh, we've, we've discussed it quite a few times on the, the last few pods. So I want to kind of move forward with that. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about a couple weeks ago that I have a chance to, to react to, and it, it, it's funny, it's been it's been now two weeks since this has happened. Uh, Eli Manning uh, retired from the NFL from, from New York Giants. Um, two weeks, actually, when this podcast is published, it'll be two weeks since his retirement. Um, and obviously, when you talk about Eli Manning, talk about the situation with him, the first thing that comes to mind now is: is he a Hall of Famer? Is he not a Hall of Famer? All that. I mean, obviously, his career is one of the, one of the most complicated ones on the field. Of course, not all off the field. Off the field, he, he you, you wouldn't hear anything about him off the field. But on the field, a little more complicated. A little more complicated because uh, you know he's a he's a two time Super Bowl winner, two time in Super Bowl MVP. Um, he's I mean, he's a lot of arguments on both ends. You know, you know the th- the thing is. You know, I think a lot of the discussion around the Hall of Fame on both sides have become a bit, a bit disingenuous, to some degree. You know, the people saying that if, the people who are against the Hall of Fame are saying that if he gets in, you're basically lowering the standards of the Hall of Fame. If you got to think about it, he shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. And I get it. You know, the thing is, he also holds pretty, you know, consistent numbers in terms of. Top ten in all relevant passing statistics. Yeah, statistics. Um, and you know, again, the Hall of Fame is an individual award. I mean, Dan Marino didn't go to a didn't play, win a Super Bowl, but he's the first ball Hall of Famer, as he should have been, of course. You know, but I think we 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 weigh the rings too much, and we weigh the rings too less. I mean, I, it's uh, it's one of those things. I mean, the thing the thing is that for, for the argument for him, you know, people are saying, well, he's a five hundred quarterback and He's, you know, he's never was considered a top five guy in a league at any point in his career, which I disagree. I think it was probably one or two years we were considering him as a top five quarterback. I think in 2012 or 2011, we were, 2012 definitely, after the, the second Super Bowl, there was a lot of discussions about Eli Manning being a top five quarterback in the league at the time. I remember doing rankings on, the, um, on this podcast when this show just started with, with, with Zach and, you know, some of my old friends, you know, Chris and Ryan and all that, and we were t- discussing, you know, top 10 quarterbacks. We, we used to always rank the quarterbacks coming to the year, in, in, you know, in, in our early shows heading into the season. And most of us had Eli Manning in the top five, coming off what he, what, what he did the year before that. So there was one year where definitely he was definitely considered in the top five. Um, but also, to not take away either, too, you know, people saw, like, he, again, one set, I think it's 117, 117, I believe, this is his record. You know, the thing is, this is why I don't, I don't want to run with that either, because there is precedent for this. Also, we do have two quarterbacks who actually made a hole, who actually are in the hall that actually uh, um, were, you know, sub five sub five hundred quarterbacks. And, and for the record, it's overrated because the fact of the matter, you know, this is not baseball. Football is three phases: there's offense, there's defense, and special teams, and the quarterback only has only controls one third of the of the game. All right, Joe Namath is a sub hundred quarterback, but he has a Super Bowl and he's in the Hall of Fame. And I think Sonny Jurgensen is the other the other, other quarterback that uh, was sub five hundred but in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, did the argument against him? You know, you can make a case that his last few years have not been kind. He's he's been pretty terrible the last couple of years. You know, and even these are years where he is, he is still was considered at the end of his prime, he was still good enough to you know, at least impact the team in a positive way, and he didn't do that on the field anyway. Um and it's funny, ever since the Super Bowl win in twenty eleven, you know, the trip the trajectory of Eli Manning for the most part has gone down. But again, you had the two the two Super Bowls. You had the two Super Bowls against the Patriots, beating Tom Brady and and Bill Belichick and and, and, and that narrative. You know, you know, I like I've actually sort of done about face now on a discussion three, four years ago. I would have said he was no brainer Hall of Famer. Maybe not first ballot, but he's definitely Hall of Famer. Now, I'm a little hard pressed to just say yes. Now, do I want him to get in the Hall of Fame? Absolutely. 
I'm a big Eli guy. You know that. Um, but, you know, I tend to be a little, un, you know, try to be unbiased when it comes to these, these discussions. You know, but, you know, I'm going to miss Eli, though. You know, his, 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 Eli, he was definitely some, you know, the New York media is, 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 is not forgiving and not kind. But yet, his personality allowed him to thrive and survive in a, in a market that will eat you up and swallow you whole. And he did it as though no matter what you said, he was always unfazed, good or bad. You couldn't tell what Eli meant. You couldn't tell if he was pissed off or not. He had the same face all the time, whether he was winning or losing. Um, so, I don't know. It's, I don't miss Eli, but it was time. I actually, and I said, I predicted did, you know, that he retire um, last year at the same time, around this time. Because I, because I, I've heard, and certainly this played out the way I thought it would. Not to, not, not to brag here, that um, um, he had no interest in leaving the tri-state area. He was very happy with his family, uh, his wife, four kids, um, in being in New York, where he's uh, New Jersey, wherever he, he lives at. He's definitely in the tri-state area. He had, no, he had no interest in leaving there, and I, I, I you know, and I, if he's happy, he's happy. And he seems like a simple guy. He seems like very, you know, for a guy who made a lot of money in his career, he seems very simple. He's very classy. He's very down to earth. He's very uh, simple to the to the point. He's, he isn't what you consider, you know. He isn't uh, when you know. He's definitely one of a kind. And we're gonna miss Eli in New York, obviously. It's time. Obviously, it's time to turn the page. I said that during the year when we went to Daniel Jones in Week Three um, last season. Um, but certainly now, it's uh, it's, it's now definitely Daniel Jones era. Um, as we uh, enter 2020. Okay, so what else do I have on, on the docket for uh, the show today? I'm going, I'm going through the list of things that I want to talk about. That I uh, NBA trend in line, mainly the Miami Heat. I want to discuss uh, the Heat. You know, obviously having, having a really good season. I think they're 34 and 16 right now as of recording. I'll tell you right now because they're actually, with, I believe, the f- either the third or fourth seed in the Eastern Conference. They they've already. Over, they, they've already um, more than surpassed expectations come to the year. That's not even a conversation. Um, let me see right now the record as a, as a recording. Yeah, I was right. Thirty four and sixteen. They are fourth in the East right now. You know they they got a three and a half game lead over the Pacers for the fourth seed. So right now they have some distance. Um, they're still in, in a race for for two between Toronto, Boston, and themselves. Um, there's two and a half games uh, between the two, the three teams in that order. Um, they made some moves. They made some moves. And Pat Riley, we, we said this, like, um, 2016, 2017, the, you know, when they, he got sentimental and he went into, you know, the heat, that heat team, 2016, 2017, went, that went, uh, 11-30, start the year, and then 30-11 to end the year, ending, ending the season at 41-41, um, deciding to pay James Johnson, Deion Waiters, all those guys, uh, those contracts, which at the time I was like, okay, whatever, to see maybe get maybe this coach is going to get the most out of them. And, I mean, it, they weren't terrible. They made the playoffs next year after that. Um, but, but but they had a ceiling. The ceiling was 42, 43 wins uh, a, a year. And um, and then last year missing the playoffs, albeit Dwayne Wade's uh, retirement, <laughs> you know, season was you know took away you know took away it was a, a good distraction for the team. Um, um, in, in an otherwise very disappointing year, um, but you knew Pat Riley was definitely fed up with, with the way things were going. Um, he gets in, he, he gets into Jimmy Butler's three stakes. He trades away Hassan Whiteside, which we all thought was impossible to do, but he did that. Um, he got rid of a lot of piece, a lot, a lot of bad contracts, and now he can cont- he got rid of the, the remaining guys on the contracts that he no one thought he could get rid of. Deion Waiters gone, James Johnson gone, uh, you know. And they go to uh, Memphis and Minnesota three way trade. <clears throat> the Heat get the Heat get Andre Iguodala, a, a guy be everybody assume will go to, to the Lakers or the Clippers, but the Miami Heat get him. Um, Thirty six years old, yes, a little older, yes, but still, you know, no one has to play all year, so he has fresh legs. Um, but he'll add a lot of veteran leadership to a team of young players who have more than surpassed their expectations right now in, in, into the season. Um, and you add Iguodala, which with championship pedigree. Um, we also bring in Jay Crowder um, as well too. It was another piece that came in as well too. I can't remember his name right now on, on you know as I'm doing this, but you know Pat Riley, Eric Spolstra, the Heat organization, they smell blood. They smell this is a wide open year. This is a wide open year for the, for everybody. There's, there's no dominant Warriors. The Lakers are still really good, but they're they're not infallible. 
Neither the Clip, the Clip was not infallible. Um, the, the Bucks have been dominant this year, but we, they were dominant last year, and they lost in the, in the conference championship. So every team on top, even the teams on top, are not infallible. So Pat Riley sees blood in the water, sees opportunity here, and he, he, he took advantage of that. And he what he and he almost got Danilo Gallinari from the OKC today, as well. But that didn't work out because of uh, allegedly it was it was not more so not him not going to go there, but more so getting an agreement to an extension. Um, but the Heat stay flexible too for 2021. They still get, they still have enough flex cap uh, cap flexibility to get in a room with Giannis and Giannis and Tento Kuwampo if, if 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 that opportunity presents itself, of course. Which I, I don't see why it wouldn't. Pat Riley has no issue getting in a room with anybody. Um, he's he's the Don Juan. Um, but um, you know, this is an opportunity for the Heat to really you know see what this how far this team can go. And the best part about the whole about all of this is that. Riley got rid of the players that I didn't want on the team anymore. The Waiters, the Johnson were not were never contributed. They were they never they were never part of this team this year. Johnson played better the last couple of weeks. He got more playing time in recent weeks. Waiters played very little um, since you know since returning to the team about a week and a half, two weeks ago, um, and uh, we were able to move those contracts. You know, Pat Riley able to do it. You know, um, so you got you got to be very uh, a team fan myself, especially. You got to be very very I'm happy with. With that development, I'm very happy with the development. To be honest with you, um, so uh, obviously NBA um, trade deadline, uh, other transactions, of course. Uh, you know, DeAndre Russell and uh, and Andrew Wiggins switch, switch teams head to head. Vikings, Timberwolves, and Warriors swapped swap there. Um, it was actually a lot more active trade deadline week than I initially anticipated. Especially on Miami, especially on the Miami end, I was really shocked about that. Andre Drummond goes to Cleveland from Detroit. Uh, Marcus Morris goes to the Clippers, um, along with Isaiah Thomas, who will get waived apparently as well too. Lots of moves. Chris Capella got moved from to Atlanta, from Houston to Atlanta. Uh, Houston's going with the uh, small ball thing now. PJ Tucker, six five, PJ Tucker playing center. Let's see. It's, it's, it's a poor man's Warriors, uh, like like they did with, with Durant and Draymond um, the last couple of years. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot going on. Uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a very it was a very active trade deadline. Lots of teams who were in the mix trying to make things happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, I like I said, the, the Kobe stuff's been kind of tough for me because I haven't really watched much basketball the last couple the last two weeks. As a result, uh, I, I've only gotten back to I start slowly getting back to watching again. It's, it's been really depressing to watch the basketball because of the, the tragedy and whatnot. But you know, it is what it is. Um, let's see what else I have on the docket here to talk about. Okay, so I also I, I uh. Saw a couple, a couple of documentaries. Well, I started one of documentary yesterday. That, um, a couple of days ago, my wife started a documentary on HBO called McMillions. It's about the fraud, the fraud, uh, the scam or the fraud with the McDonald's um, um, monopoly game uh, thing. I saw episode one on on Monday uh, or Tuesday. I think it was Monday or Tuesday. I think I saw that. Um, it's about, it's, I think it's six episodes. I'm one, one episode in. Obviously, I'll talk. I'll talk more about it as we get. You know. Once I finish it, they haven't even released the second episode yet, so I can't even like even get like mad about that. Um, I did watch Aaron Hernandez's uh, documentary on Netflix. Uh, spoke spoke about that a little bit on the uh, True to the Shit Pod with uh, Roz and G earlier today. Uh, like I said, I take a lot of documentaries with a grain of salt these days because sometimes things can be embellished. I'm not saying they're not lying. I'm not saying they're lying or not. Um, obviously, I, I believe Aaron Hernandez was a murderer. I believe you know the evidence is very strong against him that he did the crimes he did. Um, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of different angles with that. The CTE stuff, the you know the the alleged homosexuality, all that. Um, like I said, I'm not saying I don't believe it, but I take everything with a grain of salt. I'm, I'm not gonna just take you know just you know co-sign everything just because they say it. You know, so um, but it was a very intriguing documentary, three part documentary documentary on Netflix. You check it out, get a chance. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, wife and I finished that. And, uh, it took about a week to finish that one because I we our, cut our schedules, so we started episode one, uh, I think the week before, and then we waited a week to watch the, the remaining two episodes. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I I also need to fin- I, need, I need to start the Michael Fick documentary also too this week. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's one of the things on my list going forward. Um, also, um, personal stuff, personal, personal news here. Um, returning to minimalism again. Um, really getting strict about that. Um, I was telling my wife the other day that I'm really because I really want to clear our entire house out. Not everything, but things doesn't matter. I'm, I'm I'm at a point now where I'm so like obsessed with little, having little, not really ha- having not having things. 
Um, because the, you know, and, and again, this probably this is probably part of the whole Kobe thing too. And, and, and you know, death, whether it be with family or someone you admire or someone that you, that's impactful to your world, um, and it, they change your constitution. And now all of a sudden, I'm looking at things around me that that doesn't really matter, and things I'm holding on to. When I die, it ain't gonna matter anyway. Ain't going with me, you know. So I told my wife, you know, I want to go through this house, you know. Go through our garage when we have a chance to. Maybe do a spring a spring cleaning, and let's get rid of shit we don't need anymore, man. Let's get rid of shit we don't need anymore. I'm, I'm at that place now. So, and and that's part of my minimalism journey that I, on the sh I said on the show last year that I started doing over the summer, but then I sort of <laughs> you want to call it backslid, you can, you can call that, but um, I kind of slowly didn't stick to it as much as I wanted to, um, but I'm I'm getting I'm really back to it again. Um, I'm really and at that place now where um, I'm, I'm looking less about things and more about you know quality time with my family, quality time with you know my wife and kids, uh, uh, friends, uh, quality time of things that that matter to me. Like this podcast matters to me. Like this podcast will never go away because this is something that to me is a priority. This means more, but this means more to me to most of my life outside my family. Um, so yeah, but I'm I'm back to strict minimalism. Um, principles, what we call that, um, and yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now. Oh, also another show that recommended by me that I've been out for a while now, a couple months on Netflix. The Irishman saw that about three weeks ago, over two nights, because it's impossible for my wife and I to watch a movie that's almost four hours long without our kid waking up, which ended up happening um, that night, the first night we watched it. So we finished the second night. Um, great movie, uh, Joe Pesci. Uh, uh, Robert De Niro, <laughs> uh, Al Pacino, phenomenal, phenomenal um, um, work by by them on there. And the Jimmy Hoffa, you know, going over Jimmy Hoffa stuff. And uh, I, I, you know, it's funny, I, 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 just, I didn't even realize what that was. That was the uh, the plot of the movie. I thought it was a, it was actually a a, uh, a fictional movie, but they they actually used a real life event, <laughs> real life events, on it. I had no idea. I I assumed that was just a movie they. They, you know, they were doing based on just something they were just made up, but no, the Hoffa thing was real, and I obviously knew that, but I didn't know that until I actually watched the movie. So that was a great job by them. They should do all the Oscars, um, which is I think this week, by the way, too. Speaking of the Oscars, especially, um, so last, so this year, I tried for the second time to cover the Oscars on the podcast, do an Oscars podcast predictions. Um, show, my wife and I were going to do it this year, again, not realizing that most of the movies that are nominated for the Oscars are all in the theaters right now, most of them are in the theaters, there's very few that were available through the streaming services, like like The Irishman was, or uh, I think was, uh, another movie that was available on streaming, um, all the movies were actually available in theaters, now, I have no problem going to the theaters watching the movie. The problem is my time is limited, and we have two young kids. One still, <laughs> one's still two years old. That requires me getting the babysitter to do so. I'm not, I'm not taking my, my kids to, the, to see these movies with me. I need to get someone to watch my kids. And again, we have parents ourselves who are that work or aren't able to take care of things, take care of the kids a moment's notice, and our time is limited as it is. So unfortunately, our our attempt to cover the podcast again this year um, has failed. Um, at least this year we tried. We really did try this time around. Last year I said we we're going to do the podcast on Oscars, and it really didn't push. I really didn't push it that much, to be honest with you, because by the time we got around to, to January, the nominations were out, and I'm like, okay, well, let's try this, but I don't know if I have enough time, and I didn't even bother pushing it again. This year I really made an attempt to do it. We, my wife and I, we actually sat together. We actually researched the movies, figured out, and, and then when we knew they were in the theaters. We even said to ourselves, "Okay, how can we do this? How can we actually, you know, get our, get ourselves in a place where we can go to the movies and see, and see the, uh, you know, and see these films together as a couple?" And it was impossible because of our schedules. You know, there's too, and the thing is, is, there's too many movies and not enough time. That's the issue too. And I don't want to half-ass it either. I don't want to do, just watch. You know, I think we had kind of like 18, 19 movies we had to watch, and I, 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 we didn't want to half-ass it. That's the thing. We don't, we don't want to half ass it. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. So maybe next year I'll be a little better, better prepared to do it. You know, obviously, we, you know, I'll know this time around 
in late 2020 that the movies that are out in theaters are going to be nominees for the Oscars most, most likely. Um, I'll do my research going forward into that. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see if, if we do it next year. I, I, I would like to, to, to blend more of that. I mean, one of the things about this podcast I, I do love, and you know, we're now in our ninth year doing this podcast, or Antoine and ninth year doing this podcast, is how the, the show has changed. And I spoke about in the past about this show, how it's changed from being a sports podcast and only sports to now slowly through the nine years into just a variety of things. This is now this show's not this is no longer a sports show. This is something I just this is a podcast I do with my friends, people who I I want to talk to about life, sports too, politics, pop culture, you name it. It's all on the table. Um, or I'll come on here like right now and just talk about things out of my chest. You know, I'm so glad I'm I'm, I'm in a better place with this show than I've ever been because I, I'm. For the first time, I feel like I have the freedom. And I wasn't the freedom to do it before, but I don't like being stuck in the box. I've always said that, and uh, I'm so glad I'm, I'm I'm embracing more of this. You know, doing more variety themed stuff. It's not a sports podcast. We talk a lot of sports on this podcast because sports is important to me. I love about football, basketball, you know, baseball too. Uh, you know, lots about wrestling, but I also like to about politics. I love to about you know, you know, pop culture, music, you know. Movies, TV shows, especially. So, I'm so glad uh, I'm, I'm I'm embracing this new this direction, and have been doing it for for the course of the last couple of years, especially especially the last year or so. I've really taken it and run with it. Um, finally, before I go, and this is quick, I guess. Uh, Bill Simmons and The Ringer, well, should I say Spotify has bought out The Ringer, and and you know Bill Simmons Ringer um, platform. Um, Obviously, the podcast, they, you know, they're, the, the, the Spotify was already featuring one of the Ringer podcasts recently. I think it was called the the, the uh, Hottest Take, whatever it was called. Some, some mini five, ten, ten minute podcast they do a day, talking about takes the, of, 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 of the day, whether it be sports or whatever. Um, well, Spotify is now eating up the <laughs> Spotify's really gotten into the podcast game. They acquired the, the Ringer. Don't know the costs they've got it in, but. Um, Obviously, a lot of people are worried that by this happening, that you know, will Spotify start charging for the podcast? Well, here's what you do know about Spotify. There are podcasts I do like on Spotify that are exclusive to Spotify. Um, Jamel Hill's podcast is pretty decent. Uh, the Joe Budden podcast, which I listen to from time to time, they're all exclusive to Spotify. So right now, I don't see them going that route. I think that what they're going to do is take. Enough podcasts that are deemed popular, you know. Obviously, getting the Simmons stuff is huge because obviously Bill Simmons podcast is, is humongous. Um, yeah, you, know, you have the binge mode pods on there, and a couple other important pods on there. Um, I don't think they'll charge right now. I know, I know, Luminaries is the, was the first uh, podcast uh, platform that started charging for exclusive uh, episodes for certain shows, like uh, um, the Iron Report podcast. I used to listen to, but I stopped listening to it because number one. I gotta pay for it, and I'm not not that I, not that I wouldn't pay for it, but I pay for a lot of uh, content of other things, WWE Network and you know Netflix that I did even if it's just if it's just seven dollars, it's still seven dollars. Um, so I don't want to I didn't want to go there, <laughs> you know. So um, you know uh, th- th- that's just that. Um, but. This is a big. This is a big thing. This is a big acquisition for Spotify because now, you know, I, I there's, there's another company that bought out Barstool Sports. So this is a pattern here. Podcasting is still a niche, but it's it's starting to get more and more straight mainstream. And uh, Spotify sees the uh, sees the. You know, I said right in the wall, but Spotify sees the opportunity here to, especially the Ringer, and Bill Simmons, who's actually embraced the medium for a long time. He's been podcasting for 13 years so definitely a big uh, big story there in uh, tech and whatnot so all right before we get out of here here is a uh, Dane Thompson of around the around the association podcast around the association.com uh, radio hosts uh, sp- these all oh, manual trades comes to sports especially to as we talk about the NBA uh, trade deadline that has passed uh, a couple hours ago here we go okay on the line with us we're gonna talk about NBA trade deadline um, uh, 
recap with the man, Danny Thompson. It's been a little while since in the pod. Danny, what's up, bud? EJ, it's been a while. I mean, it's just finally like going back to our 80s wrestling days. It's like when Hulk Hogan and, and the Macho Man get together and Mega Powers are back once again on the podcast. Did you see, did you see what I posted earlier today on Facebook, the, uh, the breakup of the Mega Powers? I mean, it was almost for us to get back together on the podcast because you know you can't you can't be uh you can't be broken up forever. Yeah, <laughs> I got Dan. I gotta be honest with you. Dude, I, I, I'm truly shocked at how busy this deadline was. I thought it'd be maybe some moves here and there, some minor moves on the radar. First off, people asking me all week long, "Oh, did he can do anything?" I'm like, "Nah, did he can probably stick it out with his team and go forward." And they were probably the busiest, busiest team with the entire process. <laughs> It was like, you know what though? I feel like Pat was sending a message. Yeah. And the message was clear to every agent in 2021. We're here. We're going to win. So it's kind of like the, when, when, um, was it? I wanted to go back to the Source Awards, you know, when Sugar Knight was like, if you want to be with somebody, come to death row. And Pat Riley was like, listen, here's what we're going to do. And we're going to make every move possible to show that every free agent, that number one, we're making business. Number two, that we want people to come to South Beach. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and this is probably been Raleigh's been mo for the last really the last uh, few months, like ever since last season ended. Like mm-hmm. there was there was this this, this uh, attitude after last season. You know, obviously the, the good thing about last year, the, only, the good thing about last year being, uh, you know, Dwayne Wade was a great distraction for otherwise disappointing season for the Heat last year. But the minute that was all over, you knew, and I, I followed this up obviously very closely because I'm a diehard Heat fan. Um, you see, you saw, you saw Riley and and in, in just the way, you know, from the time camp started, you know, when they got Butler and then getting Butler, you know, obviously and and the culture change there, getting rid of Whiteside, and then you see James Johnson, you know, being sent home. He's in shape, not in Heat shape. The Dion Waiters thing, the way it was handled, they meant business when the word go. It's translating the wins obviously this year. How well this team is right now, currently before the trades, we didn't know. And I, I, I think Riley mm-hmm. saw an opportunity here. There's no clear cut favorite right now in the NBA. Lakers are good, but they're infallible. So are the Clippers. So are the Bucks. So teams like the Heat, teams like the Celtics, teams like the Raptors, they see an opportunity here to, uh, they could probably, if go things go their way, they could probably get to the finals this year. I don't know. I mean, that's that's the, that's the attitude I'm seeing here from the Heat. At least. I think. I think the second you add Jimmy Butler and the second every, and they started winning, it just changed everything. Mm-hmm. And then Riley realized, you know what? I can extend this window to about two years. And then in two years, if this window doesn't work, I'll just trash everything. I have Butler. I have the kids. Hey, Giannis, come to South Beach. Well, or Donovan Mitchell, let's come to South Beach. Let's figure this out. Yeah. I mean, a lot of opportunities there in the next couple of years. So you can stay, stay competitive and still have an opportunity to be flexible in two years. So that's good. Um, obviously, they get Andre Godala. Um, they get uh, 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 Jay Crowder, obviously three, te- three uh, six player trade, three teams. Um, they get rid of, and, and the, the best part for me personally is the fact that they didn't even touch their the, the young guys other, other than Winslow, uh, Justin Winslow. You know, Bam didn't mm-hmm. get touched, Tal Hero didn't get touched, Duncan Robinson didn't get touched. Um, so the core stays together. Um, who won this trade, man? When you look at the very beginning, it was like, wow, because you didn't think what, you didn't know what Miami was going to do because they were expecting to also land Danilo Gallinari and all this as well too, which would basically put them right in the, in the, the in the, t- the talk where you're saying of the Clippers, of the Lakers, and of the, the, the Milwaukee Bucks as the elite in the NBA. But even with this trade, I think it's a win-win for both teams. Mm-hmm. And I'll say it because of this. Now, I know that the, the Grizzlies taking on Deion Waiters and Flaily bad contract, which should be bought out, was bad enough. But remember, for even with Justice Winslow's injuries, Justice Winslow was becoming himself a really, really good player for the back one out. I mean, at times last year, uh, he was the point guard. He was controlling the offense. He was doing things that we've never seen from Winslow before, and it's a complete evolution of his game. The only issue with Winslow is that it's been injuries, and he's going to one of the youngest teams in the NBA, guys he's familiar with. And I think the, like the oldest player, I think, is about uh, the main guys is Valachunas. And he's not that old of a guy. Uh, on the Heat side of things, adding Andre Iguodala, of course, is the big, is the big part of it. But to me, the, the addition of Jay Crowder might be more important than Iguodala is because really? Crowder, and I'll say this because Jay Crowder can do the same things that Iguodala has, but Iguodala does not, but Crowder doesn't need 
two, three, four weeks to get himself in basketball shape. Crowder can do it right now. We've know we watched him in the playoffs. He is a playoff caliber defender. He's a playoff caliber shot maker. He does all the little things Iguodala does. And now Miami at end of game situations, especially when you're playing guys in the East, they had as many as four lockdown defenders at one time on the floor. And you can throw almost anybody out there. Miami's dangerous. So it's one of those few trades where and then Miami was able to keep their flex, like I said, financial flexibility and at the same time show that they can win this year and next year. So this is one of the few trades that both teams win. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Like, uh, you know, Justin Winslow, obviously I'm a big fan of his, but I think, you know, hearing the things I've he- I heard locally, you know, that there was some disconnect between him and the uh, the front office. Uh, he-, he definitely needed a, uh, a new scenery. I think Memphis is definitely a team you want to go to. This- that team's on up and up. They're right now they're the eighth team mm-hmm. in the Western Conference, and, you know, John Morant has been balling this year. So, I mean, that's a good place for him to be at. Of course. I, I don't think it, I don't think I say it's one of those times where even with Dion Waiters salary flying out the window, and you know more times like oh my oh man I'm taking Dion Waiters for this. I think for Winslow in a, in a fresh pace, listen like you said, John Moran has been phenomenal. Jaron Jackson's been really good. They just gave Dion Brooks the extension. You know that they made this the hiring of Taylor Jenkins, a guy who nobody knew in the beginning of the season, seemed like a genius move. The Grizzlies can't lose right now, and I love it. I love this deal for both teams. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, well, the big deal today. We had the, uh, the the another big deal today uh, with uh, Andrew Wiggins and DeAndre Russell swapping, swapping teams between Golden State, Minnesota. Who won that one? I will say this: I've called this trade since the second of DeAndre Russell signing in that uh, out in Oakland that they were going to be swapped one another. Go back to my podcast, which is uh, on Spreaker and iTunes and everywhere a podcast goes. Around the association, guys. July. Yeah, around the association of podcasts. I've been saying this on my podcast and on my on my radio show out in Orlando on 98.5 The Wire, which is called Beyond the Buzzer, Saturdays at 11 a.m. But I have said this for long. that this is a trade that makes the most sense. There is no way that D'Angelo Russell was going to fit long-term with Clay and with Steph. They figured this out. What Andrew Wiggins brings to the table is a more athletic version of Harrison Barnes was during the first set of championship, championships. A guy that can is super athletic, can defend, and if you need him to, can knock down shots, and is athletic enough to create his own shot. Andrew does not have to be in the spotlight. He's going to be in it now on a bad team, but when Clay and Steph come back, they're going to be angry and completely pissed off next season. You have him as a fourth option. And that's the third or fourth option, and that's dangerous. Oh, yeah, I agree. The with other, Culture change. The, the other part is, the interesting thing is now, the pick that they received from Minnesota is top three protected. The Timberwolves uh, are a humongous losing streak right now, and the, the hope is that this pick doesn't convey. I know the draft class isn't good. The, the, the thing is, the hope is that the, 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 the pick stays in the top three. That way it's unprotected next season and it potentially is a better draft class. On top of that, they got rid of uh, they got rid of the tax, so that's the reason why the Warriors really did well this trade. On Minnesota side of things, listen, they've been chasing D'Angelo Russell for over a year. They couldn't get the numbers to work over the summer, and D'Angelo uh, Russell and Carl Three Towns are best buddies. Oh, wow. They're great. They're best of friends. They've been wanting to play together for a long time. Uh, they've known each other going back to the days I think of AU, AU ball and college uh, and, and those things. Uh, where, where, because uh, Russell went, went to high school down here in Florida, uh, Orlando at Mount Verde. Mm-hmm. They're best of friends, you know, and they're losing 13 straight. Wiggins, top, Towns is starting to lose his mind because he's one loss away from, uh, I think, either tying or breaking the most consecutive losses by a number one pick with Michael Oliver Candy, and nobody wants to be that successful. Oh, of course not. No, I agree with you 100%. Um, so this, 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 this and, and, go ahead. Uh, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. And, and the Timberwolves probably solve a problem. They got a point guard. They they trade Jeff Teague away. They let Derrick Rose go in the offseason. They were down to guys out. I, the EJ, they were down to me and you playing point guard. So they got what they're looking for. So And they got them close games out. So I think it's a, it's, a must, it's, a, it's a big win, but I like the fact that the Warriors could potentially have two top five picks in this draft with Andrew Wiggins. EJ, here's the thing. What happens if the Bucks don't win the championship? And they have the time clock ticking on Giannis. Who says no to both those top five picks, Andrew Wiggins and a 2022 unprotected first-round pick? 
for for Giannis in the summertime if the Bucks don't think they can Whoa, sign it, that's close a, the deal. That's a that's definitely a narrative that I can see play, being play, assuming the Bucks don't do don't hold in the bargain. Absolutely, that's that's I can see mm-hmm. that playing out. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Andrew Drummond, uh, Andre Drummond, Andrew Drummond, Andre Drummond, um, trade to the Cavaliers today. Uh, what do you think? This is the biggest head scratcher of the day because I saw it come across my timeline today. I was at work. Now, mind you, I'm working throughout the day, and my time, my, my phone's going off, and people looking to come crazy at work. Mm-hmm. And I said, Andre Drummond goes to Cleveland, and I kept waiting for like the, the LOL or waiting for like the emoji, something to say this is not real. And then I saw what we're back for it. So I saw Andrew Wiggins get traded for literally um, the original Major League VHS season two of the Steve Harvey show on DVD <laughs> and one month of progressive insurance. I'm like, what the hell is this deal? And allegedly, too, and, he wasn't even know he didn't know he knew nothing about the deal until the after the fact. And this, yeah, he didn't know nothing about the deal. And here's the worst part. The Pistons actually have a decent chance to make the playoffs. The Cavs have no chance to make the playoffs. So you ship a guy that has given you his heart and soul for literally since the time he's been in the league, the league's lead rebounder, uh, multiple time all star, and you train him into a situation worse in his contract year. And, and the Cavs take on another center where they already have Tristan Thompson on the roster. And the word is that Thompson's not even getting bought out now. So. How is that going to work with Tristan Thompson, Andre Drummond, and Kevin Love? I, I'm confused. Unless they're doing the opposite of the of the Rockets and playing big ball. I, I don't understand this move for Cleveland. There's no way Dre resigns in Cleveland in July. I don't care what full court press they put on. Listen, you can you, you can have Baker Mayfield, OBJ, and Francisco Lindor all attempt to try to keep this man in Cleveland. There's no way hell is happening. On the other side, I don't know what Detroit could have got for it. I know they didn't want to lose for nothing. But John Henson, I don't think he's even played all season. Brandon Knight couldn't get playing time over arguably the worst backcourt in the NBA and Colin Sexton and Darius Garland as a second-round pick. So, yes, the Pistons gave up nothing. They gave up nothing to get anything, and I gave it all sort of process. I, this might be a lose-lose trade because I'm still shocked at what the hell, hell the Cavs are going to do with Drummond. You think any chance they get rid of Blake Griffin between now and uh, next year? Um, they need to find a sucker because Griffin's got, you know, he's already got Albatross for contract. The man's had two knee surgeries and left two knee procedures in the last eight, the last 12 and a half, maybe 14 months. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see it. It's one of those contracts that's going to be kind of like, it's going to be eaten until we get closer to the end of that deal. It's just too, too much, too many miles, too much money, and too much money down the road for it to get moved. Right. Okay, Marcus Morris to the Clippers. Uh, I like this move. Toughness, uh, another guy that can definitely help them in in the playoffs. Um, your thoughts? I mean, could the could the Clippers add anything else? And they didn't give up. They didn't trade Mont- Montrezl Harrell. Thank God. They didn't trade Lou Williams. Like they are still loaded to win this whole thing. And now they're start. You're pushing a starting five of Patrick Beverly, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Mook, and then you have what? Zubek or whoever you want to play at center, like that's insane. And now they kept Morris away from the Lakers. And you add the NBA, well, a top five three point shooter in the NBA, a guy who's having his career season, and you're asking him to be a, besides being a tough guy, a no defender, and another guy that Kawhi Leonard allows Kawhi Leonard and Paul George not to have to guard the star player for 48 minutes in the playoffs. Wow, what a move for, for for the Clippers! I mean, it's basically lights out at this point. You, now, so, if they only get if they only get a point guard, Darren Collison. So you 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 call, they're, you, they're consider, you consider them the favorites in the, right now to win the, win the title? Uh, they were the favorites until last week. And now what? It's the Lakers. You think Kobe's death actually may propel that team to do some crazy? Could be. I, I mean. L- I mean, you know, motivation, inspiration is a, is a completely different thing. I mentioned the show on Saturday. I think that once it sits in, because now we have a date for the funeral, and once, you know, all that's laid to rest, we've, and, and EJ, you've seen this down being in Miami, where LeBron James goes dark, and LeBron James literally just blanks out. 
I ha- I don't know a single player in this league or a team in this league is going to stop LeBron James when he's in zero dark 30. I think from the time this funeral happens, in, and I think starting in March until June, LeBron has nothing but one thing on his mind, and is that is to unify Laker Nation and bring them a championship. I think this is the year to do it. They won't do it past this year. This is their window before everything breaks open. All right, finally, last one before you go. Uh, the, the, the trade happened two days ago. Clint Capella to the, to the to the Hawks. Your thoughts? I I love the deal for the Hawks because on top of that, you added Dwayne Dedman. Listen, Atlanta had a choice in the offseason. And if you look at the free agent market when it comes to centers, it's do you want to spend your cap space on Andre Drummond at almost $30 million a season? Am I going to trade or go sign with Jonas Valachunas? You know, that could potentially be 18 to $20 million a season. Do I really want to step in those boundaries, Bismack Biombo? Or do I take a guy in Clint Capella that does about as many of the same things as Dre does for half the cost, and I have him under contract? I think Dwayne Dedman is good because Dedman, number one, didn't want to leave him. Man, in the first place got offered a lot of money for the Kings. Two, he's a guy that sets screens and can actually hit three pointers, and three, he rebounds and block shots pretty well. Now Atlanta has a, a wonderful rotation. They kept their financial flexibility. They can re-sign John Collins, and you already have a young nucleus that has uh, DeAndre Hunter. You have um, Cam Reddish, Kevin Hunter. The pick this year. That just leaves one thing in 2021, EJ, and that's Donovan Mitchell. I said, 2021 is going to be interesting, fascinating, fascinating more so because there's such a mystery around it. There's nothing you can well, put your finger on. It's well, the thing is, you can start, just, but EJ, as everything we've learned when it comes to free agency and, and guys coming together, it's all about friendships. It is all about friendships because it's interesting. Donovan Mitchell and Trey Young are, are really extremely close. They're also all stars this year for the first time. Right. Does this, this remind you of what we would go? And then not to mention, we have Team USA camp going on mm-hmm. in July. This always happens, especially when guys get together in free agency when these things happen. Think about how Team Banana Boat got together. Mm hmm. It's all because of the Olympics. It's all because of the time they spent in the All-Star Games. It's all about group chats on the side. The thing with the Hawks was they Trey and Dre, Andre Drummond, had a very, very good relationship along with John Collins. Atlanta was scared that if they paid Drummond $30 million, what did they have left in the future? Getting Capella for half the price basically allows you to extend John Collins. And now you can play on the friendship of Trey Young and Donovan Mitchell and John Collins to say, hey, Donovan, do you really want to spend the next five years playing in Utah? Or do you want to come to Atlanta in the change of conference with your best buddy? We have a shot blocker. We got your other buddy, John Collins, and we have a young team. And you're the one missing piece because Trey is getting killed at end of games to carry us to the elite level in the Eastern Conference. I can see Donovan Mitchell as a member of the Hawks in two years. Again, as we've seen in the last 10 years, nothing will shock me at all, Danny. Nope, nothing will nothing shock at all. me. Anyway, uh, check us podcast, Roundy Association. Um, get, get, what else are we going to plug for you go? Oh, man. I mean, besides AroundTheAssociation.com, the Around the Association podcast, which is back in a new format on Mon- uh, probably this weekend, uh, talking more topics, more than, than games. And then on Saturdays, from 11, 11 to 12, my weekly show, which is called Beyond the Buzzer, which is on 98.5 of the Wire, down here in Orlando, or you can download the app, uh, the 98.5 of the Wire app, or listen to it everywhere that you can listen to radio stations. Uh, I talk more than just NBA. I talk all sports with a, a local, a local, uh, a national feel with local seasonings. So it's perfect show myself and a good buddy of ours, uh, EJ, a good student of the game, and a guest of your show, Kyle Nash. Kyle is a nice. Yes. Yeah, Kyle's my dude, man. Danny, we'll talk exactly. soon. I know, it's, I know it's late there, so uh, get to get some rest. We'll talk soon, though. Thank you for coming on the, on the show. Uh, talk talk uh, trend deadline. That's definitely uh, an active, an active twenty four hours. Definitely. Hey, listen, we gotta get together for WrestleMania. That's gonna be the next one. Yes, sir. We gotta do that definitely. Definitely. All right, buddy. Be good. All right. All right, bro. You gotta take care.
Thank you.